Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back in our Father's Word. Revelation chapter 8. 8 always means new beginnings. We're going to break out the trumpets in this chapter. You want to remember the seals which we have covered, except for the seventh, are to put in your forehead. In other words, it is a teaching field whereby you must absorb what it is our Father intends to do, for he will always foretell you everything. If you really love him and serve him, he's not trying to catch you off guard, to trick you, or test you beyond what you can handle. But here we come now to the trumps. What does a trumpet do? It executes the command. In other words, the seals are not in chronological order as far as events are concerned. The seals are in chronological order as to the importance of the fact you should know. This is why that the first seal is the coming of the false Christ. That's foremost. You need to know that, that the false Christ comes before the true Christ does, or you're going to be deceived. That's what the seals are for, is that teaching. And remember that parenthetical chapter number seven, which we just completed, holds the end times until all of God's elect are sealed in their forehead, that is to say, in their minds. And now we come to that seventh seal, and then we will begin to execute the command in the order in which it happens. So. Pay attention, real good information. So with that word of wisdom from our Father, chapter 8, the great book of Revelation, the uncovering. And remember always that John was taken to the Lord's day, first day of the millennium, so that you can see these things transpire. Verse 1, and when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Now, this is real simple. What happens in the sixth seal? Satan and his group are cast out of heaven, and, and um, there's peace on earth. I'm sorry, there's war on earth, but there's peace in heaven. It means they're observing what's happening. And when we get to the <coughs> trumpets, as we're about to, there's seven of them. The first four have to do with... Um, with various events, but the last three are woe trumpets. That's where you want to be very careful when those woes begin to fall because they happen right here on earth. So, verse 2, And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. These are orders that will be given at the moment of execution. Verse 3, And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with what? With the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And this, this goes all the way back to an, another chapter where God said all your prayers are in, in the vial. In, in, they're, in, they're bottled. They're here before me. And this is just like um, in chapter 6, verse 9, I believe it was, where those under the altar that had shed their blood on earth wanting to know, how long, Father, before you avenge our blood? This is, this is the prayers, and this is the answer to those prayers. As that incense goes up, <clears throat> the prayers before Almighty God. Verse 4 to continue. And the smoke of the incense, those prayers, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God 
out of the angel's hand. Don't ever think that God doesn't hear your prayers. The trump executes the answering thereof. Verse 5, And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And certainly that's the preparation for the first trump when you begin to see those things and you see them come to pass. We've always had earthquakes, but the ring of fire is exactly that. It's on fire where you get a double hammer and triple hammer and major earthquakes. Kind of enough to get your attention in these end times. Verse 6. And the seven angels which had the seven trumps prepared themselves to sound, execute the command. Verse 7, the first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees was burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. <coughs> this happens on the earth, and it is um, naturally when we speak of a third, it was a third of God's children that Satan deceived in the first earth age. And it usually has to do with that part that can be deceived, and <clears throat> most usually are. Verse 8, And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and a third part of the sea became blood. There again, you always have that third. There, uh, well, what has happened here? A third of the people are spiritually dead. That's where the blood comes from, spiritually speaking. And, well, how do you know it's talking about people? Well, I'm going to read something to you, and you're not going to have it, but I'm going to read from chapter 17, verse 15 of this same book, Great Revelation. I want you to know what that sea is and the water is. Revelation chapter 17, verse 15. And th this is a translation or an interpretation by Almighty God himself, so don't you hanky with it. It isn't there for man to interpret. God is interpreting it for you. Verse 15, And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, that's to say the deceived ones, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So the very water itself is people, beings, a whole sea of them, a mass of them. So that's what's being that's what's being deceived here. That's why the blood is pouring forth, spiritually speaking, <coughs> to deceive a third of God right out of the I mean just coming out of the there'll be more deceived than that. But coming right out the gate, uh, Satan harvests a third of them, and, and uh, they are just spiritually dead. Well, how could you say, brother, they, many of them are Christians. Uh, you got that right. But the minute a Christian starts worshiping Satan instead of Christ, he's no longer a Christian. But they didn't know. Well, God warned them. He sent them this letter that they should have known. If, it, if they had paid any attention even to the first, very first seal, Antichrist comes first. Here he comes. <clears throat> He's going to deceive as many as he can. Let's go with the next verse. Verse 9. And a third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. Now, wh but now what is this sea? Again, it's the people and the nations. A third of them spiritually dead. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. That commerce even, the world trade, going bad, going to be done away with. Verse 10, And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers, and upon the fountains of waters. And uh, naturally, we, we know what that is. 
If you've studied God's Word, you know what it is. What did Christ teach, I mean himself, in Luke chapter 10? You're not going to have it, but make a note. Luke chapter 10, verse 18, the teachings of Jesus Christ after the 70 return. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Lucifer means bright and morning star. I be, behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. How, how much is that? All the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now, I, I don't know. Do you believe the Lord Jesus Christ or do you like to fear fear itself and tremble in your boots over nonsense that men can put forth? God knows how to take care of his own right in Satan's face, right in his camp. Notwithstanding, we're not, not just because of that, in, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, that's to say even the evil ones, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven, and you don't have to worry about it. Written, we're written in the book of life with God's almighty blessings, his election, those that cannot be deceived. Why? Because they have the seals in their forehead. That's knowledge and wisdom and understanding. And you know that that one is going to fall. And, and uh, understand, we're not yet to the sixth trump. But what I want you to be aware of is his influence even at the third trump on earth. It's already here. The influence, I said, not him, but the influence. And you better be prepared for it. You, you, you don't want to be caught asleep. Continuing, returning then to the 8th chapter of the book of Revelation, we'll pick it up with the 11th verse. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. That's bitterness. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. They were bitter also. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter spiritually. Have you ever, have you ever, you've run across spiritually bitter people, the influence of the, unfortunately, the wrong spirit, not the Holy Spirit, can work on you, gnaw at you, deceive you, mislead you. And men, men like to prattle. And, and you get teachers that like to teach. And, you know, and, and unfortunately, you can see how important these chapters are in forewarning and forearming the people. And, and you have people running around telling you, you, preachers, you don't have to understand the book of Revelation. You're going to be gone. There's just one problem. The word doesn't say that. It's the man that's saying it, and he's lying. And that's, that is really a sad, sad state of affairs. That's why a third of them will plunk in that Satan's bed before he ever has to say, I do. And, and then they'll still claim to be Christians, only they're anti-Christians, followers of Antichrist. You want to remember, well, how does he come in? He comes in prosperously and peacefully. He does not come in with war, threats, bombings, dangers, just the opposite, peace. What's the opposite of wars and rumors of wars? Christ told you, it's not yet as long as you hear of wars and rumors of wars, but peace, world peace. And he comes in prosperously and peacefully. And many Christians are ready to pop right into his pan. Okay. I mean, ready for the taking especially when his message is, I'm going to fly you out of here. And the sad part is, he's not going to fly you out. He's going to fly you down, down into the lake of fire. It is so important that you grow familiar with the letter your heavenly Father has sent you. 
this book of the unveiling, this book that makes known the apocalypse, this book that lets you know step by step, all seven steps, exactly how it's going down. And when you take the six seals, you have one seven set, of the seven seals rather, you have seven steps. The trumps are another seven steps. The vials are yet another seven steps, all from a different profile where you cannot go wrong if you'll pay attention. So here we have this one called Wormwood, and he deceives many people. Is it not strange that uh, we had a great event that happened after the fig tree was set out in Jerusalem? It happened in Russia at Chernobyl. Chernobyl in the Russian tongue is wormwood, bitterness. And boy, it was a bitter thing that happened there. That's not going to happen to the world, though. How precious our Father is. And that happened in the third angel, that the evilness of the world was already beginning to work. The de facto does not happen until the fifth then that's a time of teaching. But the sixth is when the action really starts right here on earth. Uh, that's why you want to pay very close attention to the woe trumps. See, these are not woe, woe trumps we're reading here. It's just building up to it. Don't, don't, don't try to, don't get frightened when you're, the infantry is here because the cavalry's coming. And you don't have a thing to fear. Why? We just read in, in um, Luke 10. You have nothing to fear. God is on the throne. God is in control. Verse 12. And the fourth angel sounded, and a third part of the sun was smitten, and a third part of the moon, and a third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. Well, the appearance of the false god. You see, this is the same uh, prelude as it would say to the coming of Christ. The moon will not give her light, so, so forth, but it has to do with the brightness of his coming. But this darkness is caused by the smoke coming from the abyss, the pit, the shadow of the locust, as the locust army goes into action. That, that's spiritually speaking, but you want to be prepared for it. Again, I want to remind you, we're on the first day of the millennium at this writing. John was taken there, and he could see these things transpiring, which are happening in your lifetime, the generation of the fig tree. So it really gives you a mirror to what tomorrow brings. And in the chronological order of events, in the trumps, because they execute the command. Verse 13, And I beheld, and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Whoa, whoa, whoa! to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other, other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. Now, the more ancient manuscripts do not have the word angel here. They have the word eagle. And God likes to use analogies because if you've ever been out in the Lonesome Valley, in the desert or anywhere where it's perfectly still and you hear the scream and the cry of an eagle it's awesome to give you the urgency of these final three woes uh, just in case you don't understand woe is not good news for those that don't know any better woe does not woes do not affect those that do know better that have promptly, efficiently, and wisely have placed all seven seals in their forehead, that's to say in your mind, 
whereby you are forewarned of those events as they transpire, you can't be deceived. So even when the eagle cries the three warnings of the three vo woes, you got nothing to worry about. Because even wh wh when we read the 10th chapter and Jesus had just instructed who? 70 disciples that returned to him and said, Jesus, even the evil spirits had to mind us. What he's talking about, even the evil must obey God's own elect. When even at the time when that false one is here, that star falls from heaven, you got nothing to worry about. Do not fear, but rather revere Almighty God and thank him for giving you the knowledge and the wisdom to know and to understand the very trumps and seals. It all fits into place and it's all laid out by our Heavenly Father where nobody can go wrong. Now, we come to a very important trump in the fifth seal dominated it for you where the children cried out it kind of tells you what the remainders of saints must elect must do chapter 9 and verse 1 and the fifth angel sounded and I saw a star fall from heaven unto on to the earth and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. We're going to turn him loose. I mean, Satan's going to be released on earth. That's why it's a woe trump. That's nothing for us to have to worry about, though. Don't have to worry about one iota thing about it. Verse 2. And he opened the bottomless pit, the abyss, and there arose a smoke out of the pit. That's what darkened the sky. As the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. This is going to cause many people to think the true Christ is returned if they're uneducated, if they're uninformed, and if they have not the seals of God in their forehead. Verse 3. And there came out of the smoke locust upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. Now, you, you have to keep up with our Father. This lets you know, number one, they are not literally locust. He's using locust as an analogy whereby you have the four stages of the locust to understand Satan's little tricks, the tricks of his people, his army. The scorpion is brought into it for a very special reason. And when, when our father uses an analogy, you want to take time to study that, to know and to understand it. It said right there, that as scorpions of the earth, well, how does the scorpion have power? There you're getting to the point. The scorpion has a long tail with a stinger on it. But there's, a and he has two little pinchers up by his mouth. And there's a strange thing about a scorpion, it doesn't have a stomach. Scorpion has no stomach, to digest food. That's why God brought him, the scorpion, into this place. So, well, what does the scorpion do then? The scorpion takes his tail and addles his victim, poisons it, and then grabs it with its little pinchers of its mouth, and it's a little plain, but he regurgitates his digestive juices into the skin of the victim and the victim becomes his stomach. In other words, it turns your backbone to mush. And that's the way Satan operates. 
He literally poisons the mind and turns the backbone to mush where he automatically has a third following him coming out the gate. It is so simple if you, and naturally then the scorpion partakes of the juices that his stomach digests and he's quite healthy and the victim is a goner. That's what you don't want to become. Well, why would God go to the trouble to explain all that? Because it's needful. It's needful to you know, for you to know that as a Christian, you don't want Satan to be able to turn you to mush. You want to have power over him. And do you know how good our Father is? He, he lets you know in the next verse. Verse 4, listen carefully. And it was commanded them, God himself commanded the fallen one, the scorpions, the locusts, commanded them that they should not hurt, I repeat, not hurt the grass of the earth. Well, that blows it out of the water that they were real locusts because that's what they live on. Neither any green thing, neither any tree. That's what, but brother, that's what locusts strip. These are not locusts. They're enemies of Almighty God. But only those men which have not, I want to repeat this again, only the men that have not the seal of God in their foreheads, those that are still stupid and ignorant concerning God's word, that did not take the time to absorb the seven seals in their forehead, God commends the enemy. You, you leave them alone. You cannot touch them. And he's about to, he will soon tell them, you can't even kill the others. You can sting them. You can turn their backbones to mush. But you can't kill them. But you can't even touch God's elect that have the seal. Why? Well, they're too smart. They know better. They have power over the enemy, and they're able to exercise that power and that authority. Do, do, you know, do you know where this is spoken of? It's in a prophecy. We could go to the day of Pentecost because this is what the Pente Pentecost people were talking about, the tongue of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit speaking through them. Every language of the world, it wasn't unknown. Everybody knew it both sons and daughters. It, um, they were quoting the 25th uh, verse of the great book of Joel. My God is Yah. The 25th chapter, I'm sorry, the second chapter of the 25th verse. I'm going to read it to you. You're not going to have it. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, and the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you all four stages of that locust as they gnaw on this earth, as they deceive governmentally, politically, and commercially, bringing us into the position of that fifth trump. 26, and you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath done dwelt wonderfully, wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. Why, you've got the seal of God in your forehead. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I'm there with you. And that I am the Lord your God and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. Two times for emphasis. 28, and it shall come to pass afterward, not maybe, afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters both shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Well, I, I didn't know women were supposed to prophesy. They will at this time when the Holy Spirit speaks through them at the appearance of the locust army, God's handmaidens, 29, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. Well, what day is that, brother? 
during the locust army. We're reading about it in the book of Revelation. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. That's divine judgment, just as the trump announced. 31, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. That is, to what day is the Lord's day? The millennium, where we're studying in the book of Revelation. You see, this is the appearance of the second tribulation, the return of the true Christ, not the, not the fraud. <clears throat> 32 to complete. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. I, I don't know, has he called you? Have you had that call? He gives it to you in the book of Revelation. He gives it to you in the whole word, calling you to not be deceived, calling you to serve him, calling you to be one that he can count on, one that he can be assured of, sons and daughters. That's what happened on Pentecost Day when Peter would say, this is that that was spoken of by Joel the prophet. That's only then and then only will that Pentecost tongue be spoken. It's biblical. Either believe the Bible or, or quit. For it is a wonderful, beautiful time. And no one can ever find anything written in Acts chapter 2 that the Pentecostal tongue is unknown. It's just the opposite. The beauty of it is it's cloven. It goes out in every language of the world. Man can't fake that. And both sons and daughters shall speak when that Holy Spirit speaks through them. And you know, Jesus forewarned us of this in Mark 13. That's what he was talking about. They're going to deliver you up before the synagogue of Satan. Don't premeditate what you'll say beforehand, but speak what I give you in that hour, that hour of temptation because the gospel must go to the whole world. So there we have it, starting this fifth trumpet. Very important. We'll finish it in the next lecture. You don't want to miss it because it identifies who that star is. All right, bless your hearts. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. Hey, that number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We do not judge people. God's Word judges people because God is the judge. And certainly spiritual discernment falls on the part of those that have eyes to see and ears to hear to know who you should fellowship with and who you should not. But always sin as a helpmate to those that are interested in learning and knowing truth. How, how blessed it is. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address got a prayer request you don't need the number you don't need an address and you know why because God knows what you're thinking right now he does he's got time for you he created you for his pleasure 
Revelation chapter 4, the last verse, remember? And when you return that love, it gives him great pleasure, and that brings blessings. Okay. But let him know you love him. That's what he wants from you. Hosea 6.6, 6, I do not want your burnt animals. I want your love, grace, mercy. Okay. That's our Father speaking. Let him know you love him. It pays great dividends. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and we got Jody from Illinois. Um, thank you for your comments. Uh, did Jesus feed 5,000 men and with two fish and five loaves of bread, or was it the word of the Lord? No, he, no, he literally did. It was a divine intervention. But the, as you would learn in Matthew chapter 16, the thing he wanted people to be most aware of is that when, when, they, when he blessed those ingredients, and had people by 50 sit in order. Christ then gave the loaves to the disciples. They did the feeling, feeding. That's what disciples are to do today, is to feed the word of God. But when they picked up the fragments, this is in, in Matthew 16, Jesus said, <clears throat> I'm not talking to you about bringing bread. I'm talking to you about picking up fragments when you have a large group together that are doctrines of men, not my doctrine. So that's what you want to be careful of when you have large gatherings because you're always going to have some doctrine of men there that turns away from the real word of God. That was this warning from that. Um, Teresa from California. Um, could you please tell me what simplify means and also is it proper for a civilian to say that to a former Marine? No such thing as a former Marine. Once a Marine, always a Marine. And simplify means always faithful. And it's, it's a wonderful thing for you to say it to them. They'll, they will appreciate it. And um, thank you for um, being with us. Um, you know the trumps by the events that transpire. Uh, Melissa from, Melissa from uh, Georgia, could you please explain the part in the Bible about women and their long hair? Is it a sin for us to cut our hair or wear it short? Absolutely not. The main thing you want to know and understand about 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is what verse 10 says. Verse 10 says, a woman should always be covered, but it's talking about using Christ for your covering, not your hair. That's just an interpretation of man. The, the manuscripts mean a woman should keep Christ over her head because of the angels, the fallen angels. That's what the woe trumps are about. They're going to be thrown out of heaven. The fallen angels are, and they're coming back, and as Jesus taught in Matthew 24, hey, just before I get back at the second advent, it's going to be just like it was in the days of Noah. They're going to be giving and taking in marriage again. And, and um, fallen angels and evil religious people like to seduce women into doing their dirty work. There's nothing new about that. Even blowing themselves up. and that, Isn't that holy? Doesn't that seem so peaceful and so... Um, reasonable. Well, of course it doesn't because it's idiocy. Okay. But uh, that's, that's why it has nothing to do with your hair. You keep Christ over your head because of the fallen angels. Again, as I said, Christ taught in Matthew 24, it's going to be just like it was in the days of Noah. The fallen angels were taking the daughters of Adam to wife. And Geber were born, unfortunately. It's going to happen again. They're going to, when we get to Revelation chapter 12, you'll find out. Uh, Greg from Washington. I own my own business, and I've always been open seven days a week. I personally take the Sabbath off, but my stores are open. Is this wrong? 
not, when you have to compete in this world, the, and the better the day, the better the deed when it comes to, to survival in Satan's little part of the world. But do, if your employees, uh, if, they, if they were altered them, if they have, or some of them have to be off on Sunday, but uh, no, there's nothing wrong with, with um, pulling the ox out of the ditch when it need be done. Well, what was an ox? Well, that, that was what you worked with. Your business is what you work with. If, and you have to compete. No problem. Uh, Tammy from Georgia. Um, I've just started watching you and I've been enjoying your teaching. Thank you. You're welcome. Question. Some people believe that not all Christians will go to heaven. They go by the scriptures, Luke 12, 32. Well... <coughs> All Christians go to heaven. If a person remains true to the true Christ, they're going to go to heaven. But if a Christian is a Christian in name only and never studies the word of God, in this generation, these scriptures that foretell us all things are telling us a lot of people are going to be whoring around before it's over with with a false god. So a person can call themselves Christian, but when Antichrist comes promising peace and love and flying you away, you, you start worshiping Satan, you're no longer a Christian. I don't care. Uh, and, and your salvation Christ saved you, but you left it and turned to another so-called Savior, only he's taking you straight to hell. So it's very important that you cannot, uh, um, when, when you hinge your salvation on two or three little simple scriptures instead of all of God's word, the truth, the loaf, the whole loaf, then you got trouble because you're going to be deceived. And uh, many might say, well, I thought Jesus was understanding. Well, how can, how can um, Jesus, he's, he, is, he is very understanding. That if you were in bed with Satan, this is why he would say in Mark 13, woe to those that are with child and that give suck when I return. Uh, he wasn't talking about a physical impregnation. He was talking about wanting a virgin bride, and if he returns, and find you nursing a child, it means you were with Satan. You were with that false Christ is what the subject matter is in the chapters that that is utilized by Christ. He doesn't want you. He won't have you if you worship the Antichrist instead of him. And, and you know, nobody can blame him. At the end of the millennium, it could be a different story if they didn't have a prayer of a chance because of false teaching. And there's a lot of that to go around. Um, Margarita from uh, Canada. My question, the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we are all changed into our spiritual bodies, will the animals also be changed as well, the dogs and cats and the other animals? They all will be changed. You are not going to leave your animals behind. Okay. Well, how can you possibly document that? It's easy in the Word of God. Isaiah chapter 11 declares that all the animals are there and there are no carnivores. That that was a carnivore is no longer. and They're in spiritual bodies. Well, then, then they are changed. Well, of course they are. The Bible teaches it. We got some people running around now you can buy insurance and they'll pick your pets up and take care of them when you leave at the rapture. Okay. There's just one thing, that's idiocy because they're going with you. Isaiah 11 documents it. I don't, I, you know, isn't it a shame that some preacher comes along and mess somebody's little nest of stupidity up, but then sometimes people need to be saved from stupidity. Cl Candon's from Kentucky. I'm 11 years old, and I was wondering if you know where I could find 
the shortest verse in the Bible. I sure do. It's St. John chapter 11, verse 35. St. John chapter 11, 35. Verse 35. Dorothy from Georgia. Where does it say in the Bible that one-third of God's children fell in the first earth age? Revelation chapter 12. And you, you, do you know something? A third of them fell in the first earth age, and according to the second and third trump, a third of them are going to fall before they, he really even gets here because of deception, false teaching. In other words, if you, in as much as the word rapture is not in the Bible, and people are teaching you to almost make a religion out of flyaway, then um, you're kind of deceived before you ever get to the gate. You need to read God's word and listen to what God has to say. That's what salvation is all about, okay? So, but anyway, a, a third fell then and a third will fall real easy, but there will be a much more because other than, you know, other than the elect, it says, and the very elect and the elect, I'll include the kings and queens of the ethnos. All the world will whore after the false Christ. <coughs> They're deceived. Uh, Minion from Michigan. Was Mary, the mother of Jesus, present during the first earth age? Was she considered highly favored during the second earth age to be Jesus' mother? Of course she was. All souls were with God in the first earth age. All. Um, no, nothing was missing. And, and they rejoiced and were so happy. I mean, it, it was so wonderful. Those are the words of God himself, not, not my words. That, um, that, and, and you can read of it in the book of Proverbs, when wisdom speaks, in the 6th uh, through the 8th chapter, Wisdom Speaks, all the sons and daughters were there. You can read of it again in Job chapter 38 when God was speaking to Job concerning the stars, which is the children of God, all with him before the first earth age. They were so happy. And then along comes Satan, and the rebellion took place. And you know something? I guess our Father wants to know how long does it take people to learn because Satan's going to fall to earth again. And that woe Trump lets you know. That's what he's, this star that falls from heaven. Lucifer, bright morning star. Not the true morning star, which is Christ. And many people will be deceived that have not taken the time to love our Father enough to even care to read the letter he sent to you to forewarn you and tell you what it is he wants you to do to be one of his children. It's so very, very important. Uh, but they were all with them, and it was a wonderful place. Thank you for asking. Tricia from Pennsylvania. Do you think that God uh, story? Do you think that God is starting to tell us a story of some kind with these earthquakes or warnings? Port-au-Prince, Haiti, 7.0, um, Conception, Chile, 8.8, Twin, New Beginnings, and Conception, what happens at a Conception? Wait nine months, okay? Um, do you um, think the next one will be somewhere having to do with the Garden of Eden. Not, not necessarily. The next one has already happened. It was in Japan. Uh, they had a 6.6 .6 twins again. A and at the same time, uh, over in Indochina, there was Indonesia, rather, there was a 6.4 at the exact same time. Uh, that's two and instantly on the same rim. But uh, we're, we're getting some messages, and it is important. They're, they're pretty good shakings with the outer plate slipping under the other plates, which is really, they're doing it big time.
Christine from Wisconsin. I want to ask if the term, oh my God, is using the Lord's name in vain. It bothers me when I hear a person say it um, all too often. And I always point it out to them, asking them to use some other term. Is this a sin or not? Well, it's according to who uses it and how they meant it. There's, if you truly are saying, oh my heavenly father, if you're asking his attention on something, it's not a, certainly not a sin. But if somebody is using it as a byword, who knows, maybe that's as close as they get to God. Maybe they truly in their heart mean they need God's help in it. So if you, I would feel before I jump somebody's case about it that I might be playing judge. In other words, I might be judging what their true meaning was, reading their mind for them. So I, I would be very careful about that, very careful. Um, Christy from Arkansas. I was on the phone talking to my aunt who lives in uh, Kansas, and she said that Jesus was coming back for his saints. She believes in the rapture, and I told her that the pastor whom I listen to says there is no rapture. I listen to the Shepherd's Chapel every morning. God wakes me up, and I believe you teach God's word is truth. My question is, I didn't say to her that she was not right and that she should study God's word in more depth. How should I have handled this situation? I am a shy person. You, you handled it probably as God would lead you. you. You planted enough of a seed. That's good. If it grows, if it grows, then you can water it. If it doesn't grow, then you, um, that is your relative. You don't want to have a, never argue Bible or try to force your beliefs off on someone. Plant the seed, and if God wants it to grow, don't worry, it will grow. And um, a shy has nothing to do with it. A shy person many times plants some of the best seeds. I think you did great. Uh, Dana from New Jersey. My question is, where was the land of Nod in the Bible time, and where is it today? Um, the land of Nod is where um, Cain went and took his wife. The, uh, the six-day creation scattered to the rest of the world um, after the garden was closed. And, and uh, I make it the Near East, and so it is. You can kind of tell by, many times, by the, um, the uh, inhabitants of Cain and those that would call their king Kagan uh, and their migrations. It kind of gives you a pretty good idea. You, you have to be real careful. You do not paint there with a wide brush. Paul from Alabama. <clears throat> Would you or Dennis please tell me how to look up in the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance in the appendix the Hebrew and Greek meanings? It's real simple. First, you must determine the key word in your scripture. I'll use an example. A child asked me today, what is the shortest verse in the Bible? I happen to know that the shortest verse in the Bible is two words. It's Jesus wept. So the way you would do it, I'm going to give you a lesson. Look up the word wept and go to a place. I'll save you some time. Go to the book of John because it will give you starting with Genesis, uh, Genesis all the way through where that word wept is utilized. And come down to the book of John, and you will see Jesus wept. And then it will give you the, the Greek number for the word wept. So you have a Hebrew dictionary in that concordance, and you have a Greek dictionary. Basically, Old Testament you will find in the Hebrew dictionary. New Testament you will find in the Greek dictionary. So you would simply go there and check out that word, and that's the way you use it. That gives you the in-depth meaning of certain words 
in the original manuscripts. Fantastic tool. Bruce from Pennsylvania. I heard you say you have to earn your salvation. Where is this explained? You probably have never heard me say you have to earn your salvation. Your salvation is free. But you do have to earn your white linen that your garment is made out of. Okay. That's real easy to document. Uh, Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. The only thing that can go with you from earth is your works. And then when we get to the 19th chapter of the great book of Revelation, it will tell you that the white robe that you wear is woven from fine linen created by your righteous acts. If you don't have any righteous acts, if you haven't earned any righteous acts, you may be saved, but you're going to be naked as a jaybird in heaven. Not a pretty sight. Okay, But uh, you do not earn salvation. Christ paid the price for that. But intuitively. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. You know, when you read the letter he has written to you, it makes his day. And when you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. It pleases him. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. Again, I want to say it, he'll, he will always bless you. But now, there's one thing in your life that is very important. You listen to me good. You stay in his word every day. And his word is a good day even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. John, three letters written by the Apostle John, that disciple whom Jesus loved. The tenderness of John's writings is marked by the number of times he begins the exhortations and warnings with my little children or little children. In fact, little children is written seven times in the first epistle alone. The contents of the first epistle are practical teaching in the light of the love of God. God is life, is light, is truth, is righteous, is love. And we have fellowship with him through the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. The tenderness and love of John's writing continues in the second epistle as he encourages the elect lady and her children to love one another. He also writes, this is love, that we walk after his commandments. After these words of encouragement, John warns us that there are many deceivers entered into the world and explains how to identify these deceivers. Don't miss this opportunity to study the epistles of John with Pastor Arnold Murray.
Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Two tribulations. That's the subject we're going to be carrying today. Um, a new soundtrack for CDs. Uh, you know, anything that our Father does always ultimately, it may seem negative at the time, but it always ends up to be positive. Okay? So 